So like many of you, um, I embarked on a journey that took me here. Um, it's a simple arc that took me from Minneapolis to Sacramento. Uh, and at the same time, it's a journey uh, that's actually more complicated than that. And it precedes other arcs and other lines and other journeys. After a while, it starts to get quite messy. I know this map is not too off track from all of you. Uh, our maps of, of friendships and changing philosophies, working processes and senses of being also go ahead and complicate our own specific mapping. So it lends me to ask all of us, where are you coming from? Uh, what brought you to have your butt in these seats at this moment in time? Uh, not just the past travel that made you here, uh, but your personal growth and your personal journey. Uh, and that's something that's gonna really come to bear in, in what I'm about to talk about today. It took more than a single journey to get us here. And, and I think it's just so important that we contemplate that. So the title of my talk is A Case for Creative Cultural Leadership. There's never been a more important time than this moment to think about ideas regarding creative cultural leadership. The only way that I'm able to express this idea of why creative cultural leadership is important at this moment in time is to weave together what seems like a series of disparate ideas. Uh, um, the goal of talking about creative cultural leadership is to not get you to understand a formula adds up to 54 and therefore cultural leadership makes sense. Uh, it's not quantitative in nature. It's an incredibly personal and heartfelt case that I'm going to try to make with you today. And I'm going to weave together a couple ideas, extremism, questions, community, panic, and even astronauts. I did want to go ahead and dedicate this talk to my father. My father passed away eight years ago, and actually it was eight years ago today. And there he is with my daughter of a couple months old. Uh, his body is racked with cancer. And I'm still in a constant state of either actively or passively mourning for him. And I'm not saying that to overshare. I'm saying that because my sense is I'm not alone. Uh, I think we're all mourning someone right now. Um, the past 24 months of, um, since we've really been shut down with the pandemic and we're coming together, there's this push to want to feel like that we need to engage, that we need to move on, that we need to eat at restaurants, that we need to go ahead um, and, and be in this moment. And at the same time, uh, I would argue that many of us here have lost someone, especially over the past two years. Uh, and if we have, um, our grieving, my sense, has been somewhat arrested. Uh, and it's important for us to take that moment and understand and comprehend the magnitude of us missing someone. Um, because there's no way we can talk about this other stuff about creative cultural leadership without us just absorbing where we are in this current moment in time. So. Uh, so I really want to put that out there. So our current condition is one that's struck by things that are so seared into our memory, whether it was the political and incredibly dangerous volatility that we saw on January 6th, whether it's the rise of white nationalism, whether it's extreme changes to our climate that, we, uh, that cause all of us to go ahead and reconsider uh, our very basis, or whether it's the continued and systemic racism uh, through institutions that are supposed to protect everyone, but uh, in reality only protect a few. It's clear to me that our traditional models of leadership have failed, and now is the time for makers to be leaders. I've spent countless hours with people in communities, uh, with people doing remarkable work. As we look to doing work together, we must also look inward, and that's one thing I think that sometimes surprises people. What do you know now that you didn't know five years ago? There's a lot of focus on the past two years, but I'd say hit rewind to 2017 and figure out what it is that you, that you know now that you didn't know then. Um, being able to dig back to about half a decade is really important. And for me, it's important when I work with individuals and communities to do this type of work. The second question I'll posit is what do you know to be true that you think no one else in your field believes in? I mention these two questions because they act in many ways like an X and Y axis, if you will, for understanding the depth of our experience and our personal acumen of what we bring to the table um, as we go ahead and want to do this work. Uh, it's not enough to show up. I think it's important that we need to ask ourselves really where we are in the world, what our place is, 
uh, and we have to be really intentional about that. So this is me as an undergraduate at Alfred, uh, next to some large object which probably exploded in the kiln. And I'm going to talk about the shortest critique of my life that was the most meaningful critique. And it lasted about 20 seconds. Um, I had transferred there, I was making pots, and I think I was goaded by a colleague of mine that was a grad student, and now I think of it, I think it was probably a setup. Um, but I was asked to go ahead and, and approach Wayne Higby to go ahead and get a critique from him about the pots I was making. So uh, I, I, uh, I approached him, uh, and we set a time to go ahead and have him go ahead and, and look at my pots. Um, set at a table, uh, he came out there, I was totally excited and terrified, um, and, uh, and again, I was a, kind of a first semester sophomore, and, uh, and I don't know if you, if you know Wayne, he does this kind of heel turn, which will come up later, which is really important, but he barely stops at the table, and he, he's, he stops for a second and turns to me and says, what questions do you have for me? And I was totally dumbfounded. Um, I came with the work, I didn't think I needed to actually have questions. It's like when Chris Farley interviews Paul McCartney, like in the sense it's that moment of time. I think there's like an age generation there too. You could hear people that laughed that got it. Um, but it's just that moment where you're realizing, I cannot believe I didn't come with questions. And he just spun with his heel around and said, well, as he's walking away from you, just make an appointment when you've got some questions. Um, and that really stu stuck with me for a long time because this idea, it's not enough to do the work. We've got to show up with the questions. Uh, and I do think that that critique lasted all of about maybe 20 seconds. The other second reason why I think questions are important uh, is because of this guy, Pablo Neruda. If you're not reading poetry, you should, because not just because you can tell people and they'll make you seem sensitive, it's because it provides you with the opportunity to, to actually realize that if there aren't poetics in what you're doing, why are you doing it in the first place? And so I found myself really powerfully moved by Pablo Neruda's work, but in particular, I think something clicked when I discovered a text that was on his uh, desk next to his bedside after he passed away in 1973. And he wrote a book, a manuscript, called The Book of Questions, uh, which is translated here, where he can pontificate about anything he wants in the world, but here he goes. and and writes this beautiful series of sonnets of, I think it's about 236 questions. And they're beautiful, and, and they're powerful and evocative. Uh, like that last one, is there anything in the world sadder than a train standing in the rain? Uh, so on one hand, we've got to balance our work with engagement, with understanding where the poetics of that engagement is. The third thing that has made me fall in love with questions is with the dismantlement of the apartheid regime, in South Africa. South Africa was faced with a choice, and my mom was born in Johannesburg, and so this is personal for me, uh, but they were faced with a choice whether or not um, should they prosecute people that were involved in this regime, or was it more important to go ahead and understand a fuller sense of truth-telling about what occurred? And they went with the latter, and they formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which was to go ahead and move towards less about the idea of prosecution, but more about truth-telling. They needed to grant limited amnesty, which was painful at the time, to understand how many times was someone tortured, how were they tortured, in what way, what were the methods of the secret police, um, how, how pervasive was this, where were the bodies buried? Um, and they needed to ask those questions and needed to have answers. And they privileged questions over prosecution. We think about leadership as oftentimes having the answers to questions. And I'll counter that, and I guess I'll refute that by saying I think it's about leadership is about asking the right, poetic, generous questions. Uh, it's not, the, uh, it's not the, the questions that interrogate, like, like, you know, where were you? Where are you from? But it's the how might we questions or how can our community questions. Um, I think leadership is about asking questions, not about having the answers. In 1996, uh, I was in graduate school at the University of Georgia, and I found myself, I, I, I was diagnosed with a severe panic and anxiety disorder, which was absolutely crippling. Um, uh, it provided me, uh, it shut my, uh, shut my world down for a while. Uh, I didn't feel comfortable going out in public. Um, I didn't feel comfortable uh, 
um, socializing. Uh, I was experiencing tremendous bouts of everything from agoraphobia to everything else. And uh, fortunately for me, I, I found a pathway uh, to go ahead and, and manage this. My sense is I'm not alone in this room with other people that have experienced panic and anxiety. Uh, and it's something that, dare I say, I think has helped also define me. I'm mentioning this because I think it's important as we start to talk about leadership. I was wanting to know if there's an image that would represent me as I was talking about this and as I was building this presentation, I saw an image that my daughter had drawn of me, which you can very much see the likeness. Um, uh, and I thought that I would go ahead and use my daughter's artwork. And in some ways, I think probably it does really reflect the freneticness um, that, that panic really provides. I'm also going to say that I think panic also has provided me with an opportunity to go ahead and see it as a strong leadership quality. I think it's an opportunity for us to go ahead and see um, how we can see others in a totally different way. I've been relatively private about this until two years ago when I was tired of being in conversations in leadership about talking about mental health in the abstract. And I was asked by the website Medium to publish an essay uh, called Leading with Panic, Why Leaders Need to Talk More Openly About Anxiety. I mention this because sometimes there are moments in our world where we go ahead and the leadership decisions we make are progressive in nature. And sometimes there are ones that it feels like we're moving from one moving trait train to another and you have to take that moment to leap. But when I published this essay two years ago, uh, there was no taking it back. Um, uh, and I think once you cross that line, it's important to feel like how you own that is really important. But I would say that for me, after I published that essay, uh, I had an outpouring of individuals that wanted to talk more uh, about not just their own struggles with panic and anxiety, uh, but also what are the tools that they can use to build better communities around them. So, you know, at this stage, it's worth us just starting to rethink leadership. Um, uh, and. I think it's worth us really starting to list out some of what we consider to be traditional leadership qualities. And they're kind of what you'd expect. Individualistic, charismatic, decisive, dispassionate, unapologetic, infallible, unflappable, heroic, just to name some. And they're no in particular order. When I think of charismatic and infallible, I think of someone like Gregory Peck as Atticus in the 1962 film To Kill a Mockingbird. And when I think of decisive and heroic, now I think of it, I actually think of Gregory Peck in, uh, in Frank Savage in 1949 in his classic 12 o'clock high. And when I think of dispassionate and unflappable, I tend to think of actually Gregory Peck as Captain James McKay in the 1958 classic Big Country. Uh, and lastly, I think you guys know what's coming. Um, <laughs> when I think of individualistic and unapologetic, I just can't help but think of Gregory Peck and Captain Ahab and Moby Dick. And I... Um, thanks. I, the acknowledgement goes to Gregory. Um, the, I will say, I mean, the joking aside is that what, what's represented here, and I think what's come up and each of is really powerful to hear all the emerging artists speak to, is that there also talks about this idea of toxicity that exists within our culture and within the culture of leadership. And, and supportive programs and shows that just focus on women go to a, a point to start to address that, but, but we need to start to rethink the way we think of leadership as the way to truly, really systemically address the changes that we want to see. Um, and nothing against Gregory Peck, because you should watch any four of these films. But so when we start to counter that with creative cultural leadership qualities, uh, the ones that come to my mind, and again, they're not exhaustive. You have others, and you may think some of mine are totally uh, out of line. Collaborative, thoughtful, inquisitive, embracing of failure compassionate, vulnerable, reflective, adaptable. When I start to think uh, about these qualities, I'll think about, for example, with thoughtful and vulnerable, uh, I think of someone like Amanda Gorman. And I don't mean just because of the work that she did and, and her eloquence at Biden's inauguration, but I think more broadly about the work she brings. I think vulnerability is one of the most underestimated leadership qualities that exists today. I think we should never equate vulnerability with weakness. I think vulnerability is probably one of the hidden superpowers that don't get talked about enough. Like, and I just, I just wanna say that unequivocally here. So um, let's not 
ever try to go ahead and somehow misconstrue the idea that vulnerability equals weakness. Vulnerability becomes probably one of the greatest empathic tools that one has if you're able to access it and be honest with yourself about that. So when I think of inquisitive and adaptable, uh, you know, I can't help but think of someone like uh, Emmanuel Pratt from the Sweetwater Foundation that does work in Chicago that looks at issues regarding ecology and sustainability in the south side of Chicago. And when I think of embracing a failure and compassionate, I can't help but think of someone like Chef Sean Herman from the Ogallala Lakota Nation, who's the founder of the Sioux Chef, which is committed to revitalizing Native American cuisine and re reclaiming that important culinary heritage. And when I think of someone that exemplifies collaborative and reflective, I can't help but thinking of someone like the artist Mel Chin, whose work with Revival Fields and his Fundreds project, uh, which talked about issues regarding lead contamination in public water systems, uh, really starts to help show us a way forward. It is also worth noting that these are all four leaders of color. I did say I was going to talk about astronauts, so I am, and, and so here we go. It's really important that we steal and look at ideas from other fields. Uh, I'm a big believer in stealing and borrowing and looking over the shoulder of people that are doing things that have nothing to do with what we're doing. It allows me to go ahead and approach these situations with a degree of humility of trying to understand a specific language and vernacular. And so I was trying to go ahead and have a, I was trying to get away from work during the pandemic, so I wanted to do something that didn't do anything with work. So I started reading about astronauts because I thought it has nothing to do with running an art and design school or the work I'm, I'm passionate about, and I needed that kind of a break. Uh, and of course, not sci-fi, I mean real astronauts. Um, but, but what I found was that I was starting to come back to work, and I'll talk about why. This is Gus Grissom in the Mercury Project. Early on in the US space program, astronauts were really being seen as their high qualities was to be individualistic. They were fighter pilots. They were called fighter jacks, right? They, it was individualistic. It was decisive. It was hyper-masculine. It was, and even when they start working in teams, the goal was to still have, to make sure that there was a decisive and deliberate kind of chain of command. And that was seen as the sought after qualities when the US started their space program. But something happens when all of a sudden NASA goes into the wilds after the, after the Apollo missions ends and before the space shuttle starts, and, um, which is that they start to redefine themselves. And as, as they start to go ahead and redefine themselves, What's kind of interesting is you start to hear about this concept called expeditionary behavior. And so instead of thinking about this person's a decisive leader, they start saying so-and-so exhibits expeditionary behavior. And what they meant by that was that all of a sudden the behavior was about communication. It was a communication forward idea of being. It was a leadership and followership idea of being. It was this idea of self-care and team care. It was this notion that somehow that even if you knew the answer, it wasn't important that you stepped in, but rather you got the team to go ahead and figure out the answer and celebrated their accomplishments. It was about this idea of cooperation over competition, which was vastly different. And so I, I, kinda, I offer this as an example of how we need to look outside of our field. So one of the things that I think is really interesting is one of the worst traps that paralyze the work that, that, that I tend to do, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, is this idea that um, we think that if you have a brilliant idea, that you're sure someone else, probably more brilliant than yourself, has probably come up with it already, and there's a reason why it doesn't exist. Uh, and I guess I would counter that by saying uh, that that is just one of the, the, the key things that we all have to work against. So how do we build an equitable world that should have always existed in the first place? During the pandemic, when uh, two years ago, we were all in that kind of panic and that crouch. At the same time, I think many of us were feeling like, wait a second, there's a world that we should be trying to build that should have always existed in the first place. So I worked with two individuals that I knew a lot, and I knew that were in airplanes a lot. Uh, and they were traveling to conferences, and all of a sudden they were, they were sitting. They were, they were not going anywhere. They were grounded. Um, and the artist Carolyn Mullard, who's in the center, uh, um, and, uh, and Joseph Kunkel, uh, who's on the right. And Carolyn's a social practice-focused artist who's currently working in Germany, uh, but does f remarkable work. And Joseph is from the Northern Cheyenne Nation and is an architect and works with the Mass Design Group. Um, and the three of us came up with this series called Slow Burning Fire. 
conversations on cultural equity in a COVID and post-COVID world. And the goal was to say, how do we create the anti-conference? How do, instead of the conference being, well, I guess now you think of it, hearing me and talking about a single idea at one kind of setting, but how do we have repeated conversations over and over again? How do we feel like that we can go ahead and know that it's not gonna be uh, it's not going to be some meteoric idea. So we started having conversations and we invited speakers to come in and talk about issues like blowing up philanthropy or how do we dismantle our current systems of education. Um, and we invited speakers like Hank Willis Thomas and Christine Gaspar uh, from the Center for Urban Pedagogy. And we will always have guests in these conversations. And they started to grow and grow. And what's been amazing here is that we start to see the collaborations that have occurred through these monthly conversations uh, still to this day. Um, and it's been something that I think has, for me, kind of really reminded me that if you have a, a good idea, just because no one's doing it doesn't mean it's not a good idea. The last point I'm going to talk about is this idea of extremism, but not extremism in the way that you may think. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, when he's arrested and put into the Birmingham jail, he receives an editorial that was called A Call for Unity, which is snuck into him, written by eight white clergymen, essentially against King and his methods. Um, and he is totally riled. Um, he's totally riled about this idea that his process is too slow, that, um, that he, is, he needs to kind of, we need to do more waiting. And so he starts grabbing scraps of paper and he starts penning what ends up becoming the letter from a Birmingham jail, one of, I think, the most powerful documents about the civil rights movement that exists today. You know, he takes aim at the passivity of these individuals. As he puts in his letter, uh, wait has always meant never. But more importantly for this gathering in particular, he speaks about creativity in this document more than once. He talks about this idea of a creative outlet for nonviolent direct action. He speaks about the need for creative tension. As he says, nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and establish such creative tension that a community that has consistently refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. When he's released, he publishes his letter, and in it lies some really powerful questions. He reshapes this idea of extremism. Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice, he asks, or will we be extremists for the cause of justice? And the second question he asks is, so the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Will we be extremists for hate, or will we be extremists for love? I've talked about extremism, questions, community, panic, and I managed to thread in astronauts there too. I feel like I need to offer all of you a working definition of creative culture leadership, and I want to be clear that it's from my perspective. I hope if any of you are interested in engaging me in a dialogue, it'll be shaped by our conversations. It'll be shaped by my own life experiences. But for me, creative cultural leadership means it's about embracing artistry and innovation alongside empathy as a fundamental method for understanding the world, working with individuals and communities in solving problems. I'll just ask you to keep one last question in mind, which is how can your life experience and your creative acumen solve a problem that affects others around you? And that simple question, followed by thoughtful, collaborative, and compassionate action, for me, is the essence of creative cultural leadership.